I'm Daniel Hansen of the Maine State Police. This presentation is designed to provide you with some understanding of Maine laws as it pertains to new drivers, as well as providing you with some information that we feel is vital to help keep you safe out on the roads today. I've seen a lot of tragedy associated with bad choices that young drivers have made. My phone rings typically in the wee hours of the morning, requesting that I respond to a crash. And upon arrival at the scene, so often, I see the destruction left behind by bad choices that young drivers have made. You're gonna be presented with some cases today that are true to Maine, happen on our roads, and are young people just like you, that their lives were changed because of the choices made by either them or the people that they were with. The purpose of this presentation is that hopefully I won't meet you out on the roads like I've met so many of your counterparts. At the end of your driver's education class, you're going to be given an opportunity to take your permit test. Upon receiving that permit, which is a great feat for any young man or woman, I want you to recognize that that comes with great responsibility. Once you have that permit in your hand, you are going to be able to drive out on the roads of Maine as long as you adhere to the statute that has been created here in Maine to authorize you to do so. First, you need to make sure you have your permit in your possession at all times while you're operating on the roads here in Maine. Secondly, you need to make sure that you have a licensed operator with you sitting in the passenger seat right beside you. That licensed operator needs to be at least 20 years of age, have a valid license, and they do to have had that license for at least two years. The violations that we in law enforcement deal with associated with permits are as such. Licensee impaired while accompanying a learner. This is legitimately what you can imagine it is. If you are the licensee that's accompanying a permitted driver, you cannot be impaired. You cannot use a permitted driver as a designated driver. We basically treat this just like an OUI case. We pull the licensee out of the motor vehicle, put them through field sobriety, arrest them, and take them to jail just as such. The purpose of the licensee is to make sure that the permitted driver is learning the proper rules of the road and habits. And having an impaired passenger with them, looking over them and watching them is unsafe and it's against the law. A licensee under 20 years of age or with less than two years of having a valid license with a permitted driver is a violation of Maine law, which the licensee will be issued a violation of permitting unlawful use. The permitting off unlawful use is the act that the operator of the vehicle is on their permit and they have no authority to do so unless they're meeting the statute, which means that person needs to be 20 years of age and have a valid license and have had it for two years. So the permitted driver as well will receive a violation of their learner's permit, which will affect their ability to get a driver's license here in Maine. Just the other day, I had a traffic stop with a permitted driver where they had a passenger with them that was only 19 years of age. This was a violation of the permit statute in that the licensee was less than 20 years of age. In that situation, both the licensee that's with the permitted driver gets a violation as well as the driver gets a violation for the violation of their permit. That violation of their permit, that summons, is now going to affect their ability to get a license here in Maine. While you're on your permit here in Maine, you are not allowed to use a mobile device of any kind while operating your motor vehicle here in Maine. Doing so is a specific violation of Maine law. Having your permit on you is required by law. When you are operating a motor vehicle on your permit, you need to have that piece of paper in your possession while you're driving here in Maine. On the day that you're issued your license from the state of Maine, which I know you'll consider to be one of the greatest days of your life, understand that you're gonna be issued a provisionary license. For the first 270 days of that license, we're gonna keep you at a status where you need to follow some specific restrictions. These restrictions have been created because of tragedies we've seen out here on the roads in Maine. First, you can't operate a motor vehicle with anybody in the motor vehicle unless they are family members, unless you have somebody that meets the permit statute, which means if you have somebody in the vehicle with you that's 20 years of age, has a valid license, and they've had it for two years, and they're sitting beside you, you can't have other people in the motor vehicle with you. If you do not meet that requirement, then you can only have family members in the motor vehicle with you. Secondly, 
you can't operate a motor vehicle between midnight and 5 a.m. I can assure you there really isn't anything going on between midnight and 5 a.m. any of you guys need to be dealing with in the first place. Lastly, you can't use a mobile device while operating a motor vehicle, but specifically under the provisionary license status, there's a separate violation for doing so. These provisions are put in place to keep you safe because of the issues that we've seen on main roads. These are the violations associated with an intermediate license here in Maine. If you carry passengers beyond the restrictions on your intermediate license, you could face a fine and a suspension. We understand you have friends. We understand that you want to go and do things, but understand that we have seen over time a pattern of bad behavior, sometimes when you're hanging out with your friends and you may do things that are different than when you have your family with you, which is why the law is in place. When you think about it like this, if you have your 13 year old little brother in the car with you, you're probably gonna drive a little bit better than with your 16 year old buddy that you've known your whole life and that maybe you've done some silly things with. So that's why the law is in place. It's there to protect you and everybody else on the road so that you're safe. Remember, if you don't abide by the law, it's a significant fine and a mandatory license suspension. If you operate a motor vehicle between midnight and 5 a.m. on an intermediate license, you're in violation. Let's face it, is there really anything going on between midnight and 5 a.m. that you need to be out dealing with? I can assure you most of your parents don't want you out between midnight and 5 a.m., so don't be out there. There's a lot of bad things that happen between those hours. I've seen it and it doesn't need to happen. So under your intermediate license, make sure you're not out during those hours. If you are, and you're found in violation, you will face a significant fine and a mandatory license suspension. You cannot use a mobile device while you're on your intermediate license. In the state of Maine, you can't use a mobile device under 18 years of age anyways, but specifically, the statute covers under your intermediate license restriction. Now mind you, I get it. You guys have your phones, you're all excited, you want to talk to people on a regular basis, but when you're behind the wheel of a motor vehicle here in Maine on your intermediate license, you're just learning to drive. You're just learning the basic habits that are going to be part of your life forever. We want you to have good habits and focus on good driving skills. If you're distracted by a phone, bad things can happen. I've seen it day in and day out understand it's unsafe it's not right please don't do it and mind you if we catch you in this violation it's a significant fine as well as a mandatory license suspension i have a lot of young people and actually parents who have expressed to me that it's unfair you guys have earned your license you should be able to do whatever you want well i'm going to tell you that's not a good idea and this is why this young lady 16 years old, had just gotten her license. She had it for approximately five days. She went to a school function and she was bragging to some boys about her driving skills. She was telling the boys that she could get air with her car. Seems like a recipe for disaster, right? But can you go and tell a couple of boys I can get air with my car and not think that they want to go for a ride and check this out? Yeah, that's not happening. They're, they're going to go out for a ride. They need to see this for themselves, right? So she goes out to this back road to show them how she can get air with the car. What do you guys think happened? Nothing. Nothing happened. They went through, she did her thing, she showed them what she could do with her car, and they continued down the roadway. Everybody was perfectly fine. Then the boys started ragging on her. I thought you said you could get air with your car. Oh no, no, I'll, I'll show you. She goes back for a second run. Now she was already doing something dangerous. She was already doing this. She was already driving in a reckless manner out here already, which is bad enough. But now we've added an extra element to it with these boys being in the vehicle. I'm not saying that had they not gone with her at some point in time, this wouldn't have happened, because it may have. But I can tell you on this night, had they not been with her, this wouldn't have happened. She came through on the second run. She did indeed get air. I reconstructed a speed of 85 miles an hour. I could see in the roadway where the vehicle came back down in and when the suspension uh, compressed, the engine block came down into the roadway and scraped up the roadway. So I know she got air at 85 miles an hour on that roadway just before she hit the first of three trees. 
and went into it driver's side first. She did not come out of it. The boys made it. The boys lived. Extremely miraculous that they lived, but they did. Did that need to happen? That's what we're trying to avoid. That's why the laws are in place. The laws aren't there to try and ruin your good time. The laws are there to try and keep this from happening, to keep you safe. Anything in regards to questions when it comes to Maine State Statute, try and understand what you can and can't do. Maine.gov, Maine State Statutes, Title 29A covers everything motor vehicle related. So if at any point in time you run into anything and you're curious about it, you just look up under Title 29A and it has everything motor vehicle wise, like lights, what kind of lights you can have on your vehicle, um, that type of stuff is all right there. Alcohol and drug violations that we deal with associated with driving, operating the influence of alcohol or drugs. It's a class D crime for which you will be arrested. When I pull somebody over on the highway and I get an indication that they've been drinking or they're doing drugs. I'd like it, anything in it. Let's show it to me. They show me some kind of indication of that. I take them out and I put them to field sobriety. At the end of that examination, I have to say, I feel that this person is safe to get back in that vehicle and drive down the roadway. Um, well, no, these ones, these ones have to go as long as they're not open. The one that's open has to be dumped out, but the rest of them, the rest of them will go. Uh. There's a family of four that just left the movies and they're on their way home. That's the next vehicle that this subject is going to encounter. Do I feel safe for that family of four on their way home that this driver is not a risk to them? If I feel they are not a risk, then they go. If I feel they are, they come with me. I can't do it very well. You can't do it very well. Well, I'm not. I don't. I don't have good balance. I'm not drunk or anything. I'm. I'm sitting. Okay. Well, I'm. I'm not. I'm not quite believing that. You, well, you do appear to be pretty intoxicated to me. Um, so why don't you go ahead and step towards my cruiser for me, all right? Step, go ahead and step up to my cruiser for me. Okay, nope. Nope. Face. Face my cruiser. Yeah. Yep. Lean right over it. I received a complaint of an erratic vehicle. I responded to the area, I located the vehicle and got the vehicle stopped after I observed some erratic operation. Uh, they weren't able to maintain their lane. Um, when I got up to the vehicle, I got the odor of intoxicants. Um, I had the female operator exit the vehicle so I could put it to field sobriety. And when she got out of the vehicle, she almost fell to the ground. I mean, obviously that was a huge red flag to me right there that something's wrong here. Um, I took her to the back of her vehicle and I began to start doing field sobriety with her. And very quickly, I realized that this wasn't going to work out. Um, she was so impaired, she could not do field sobriety. She was going to fall down and hurt herself. So I stopped field sobriety uh, before anything uh, bad happened. I took her into custody, and I placed her in my car. Um, she advised me that she only had two beers, which is pretty standard for us. We get that on a regular basis. Two beers, that's all I had. Well, I took her to the jail, and her blood alcohol level was a .04. So it's very possible that the two beers that she said she had was accurate. But her impairment was not consistent with that. Her impairment was that of someone that was significantly intoxicated. Intoxication is not just about alcohol. Alcohol and drugs impair. In this case specifically, the female was on medication. The medication specifically said, use caution while taking this medication as it will cause drowsiness. It also said on the label, do not use alcohol while taking this medication as it will intensify the effects of the medication. When we take somebody into custody for operating on the influence, it's not about blood alcohol level. It's about impairment. In this case, it's a perfect example of evidence of impairment. When someone can't stand up, it doesn't matter what their blood alcohol level is because it's clearly enough impairment to show that they shouldn't be on the road. If you're under 21 years of age, here in Maine we have a zero tolerance for alcohol. If you are behind the wheel and you are found to have anything to drink, you have no license. Your license is invalid. It's a condition of your license not to have any alcohol in your system. So if I find you on the roadway and you've been drinking, I'm going to arrest you and charge you with operating without a license because you violated that condition of your license.
Also understand, here in Maine, open alcohol containers are not allowed in motor vehicles. As the operator of a motor vehicle, you are responsible for what's going on inside your vehicle. If you have passengers that are consuming alcohol, when we stop you and find you, we're going to summon you for that violation. There is no violation on statute that says passengers consuming alcohol. If they're underage, we're going to give them a separate violation for that. But know that you are responsible for what's going on in your motor vehicle. If you're partaking in the drinking as well, there's a separate violation for that. And there's also a violation for transporting alcohol. So if you're under the age of 21 and you are transporting alcohol or drugs, which includes marijuana, you're going to get a summons to go to court and stand before the judge for illegal transportation of drugs or alcohol by a minor. This is a crash I had a few years ago. This crash occurred at about 5 p.m. and the driver was twice the legal limit. Is it crazy to think that there's someone out there that's over twice the limit at 5 o'clock? My record is a .31 at about 3 p.m. So be mindful when you're out on the roadways there are intoxicated drivers driving throughout the day. It's a 24-hour day issue. If you're involved in a crash here in Maine, these are the requirements to make it a reportable crash to the state of Maine. First, it needs to be an unintentional event, which means you didn't intend for this to happen. If you're having a road rage incident with somebody on the roadway and you decide to ram into the back of them because you're angry, that's not a crash. That's an incident we're still going to investigate, but it doesn't fall under the classification of a crash. Secondly, it needs to involve a vehicle in motion. If your vehicle is parked on the side of the roadway and a tree branch breaks and damages your vehicle, that's not a crash for our standards because it didn't involve a vehicle in motion. It needs to occur on a public way. If a crash occurs in a private driveway, it doesn't need to be reported to the state of Maine for crash purposes. Any injury or death associated with a vehicle in motion that's an unintentional event that occurs on a public way will make it a reportable crash. If there's no injury or death associated with the crash, then we refer to damage. Damage estimates at approximately $1,000 or more are reportable to the state of Maine. Now understand with $1,000 worth of damage, it's the crash in totality. So it doesn't mean just $1,000 damage to the vehicle. It could be $500 damage to the vehicle, $500 damage to property, or $500 damage to one vehicle, $500 damage to another vehicle, but it's $1,000 in totality. And that damage is not, I can get this done at my cousin's garage you know, for under $1,000, so it doesn't make it reportable. It's taking that motor vehicle to an insurance-rated garage they evaluate the damage and determine it's $1,000 or more. Also understand as it pertains to value, you could have a motor vehicle that you value at less than $1,000 worth of value, but yet you can do more than $1,000 worth of damage to it. So if you take your car that's worth $800 and wrap it around a tree, that's a reportable crash to the state of Maine because the cost to repair that motor vehicle is going to exceed $1,000 even though the value is only $800 to you. If you're involved in a motor vehicle crash that meets these requirements, you are required to report this to law enforcement by quickest means. The easiest way to report a crash here in the state of Maine is to dial 911 and tell us where you are. Even if there's no injuries, we need to know and get resources to you quickly because though you may not be injured, the fact that your vehicle is disabled on the roadway could create danger to other people on the roadway and we need resources there quickly. Do not leave the scene. Make sure you contact us and report what's occurred. If you leave the scene of a motor vehicle crash in the state of Maine that's reportable, that is a crime. Also understand if you do not report a reportable crash to the state of Maine within quickest means, you could also be charged with a violation of state law. This means if you have been involved in a crash and you decide that you're going to wait and report it later on in the day, that violates statute. If you're involved in a minor vehicle incident with damage in a parking lot, that doesn't need to be reported to the state of Maine for crash purposes, but it's not a bad idea to report it to local law enforcement and let them know that it's occurred, especially if it's an unattended vehicle. Any unattended vehicles need to be reported to the owner 
And if the owner isn't present, the best way to do that is to report it to law enforcement, provide them your information, and they'll make contact with the vehicle owner. Any point in time that you're involved in an incident here in Maine with a motor vehicle, if we don't cover it as a crash, we will still provide you with a basic incident report, which you can provide to your insurance company, which will help you in the repair process. Hey! Get this tape in. I think you should have turned back there, man. It always gets us lost. Whoa. Um, I think I'll better buckle up. I can't find mine. Are you sitting on it? Are you all ready? All right. Ready. A crash doesn't need for you to put on your safety belt. Buckle up. I love that video, not just because I could have watched that when I took driver's ed, and I swear to you, I did not have the sideburns. But what I like about it is nothing's changed. It doesn't matter what area you're from. Seat belts are the most important safety device that you have in your vehicle. They absolutely are. A lot of people seem to think the airbags are the most important. Seat belt is designed to work in unison with your airbag. So as the seat belt is restraining you, that airbag catches you. I think it was back in 2005, I covered a crash. It's a father and son. They were traveling southbound on Route 26. They get involved in a head-on crash with another vehicle. And as a result of the crash, the 15-year-old got a cut on his pinky knuckle. As his hand came forward from the crash, his, his knuckle got, got cut on the dash. And uh, dad, on the other hand, died. The occupant area of the vehicle that they were in was perfectly intact. Um, the vehicle had the highest safety rating on the roadway, so it's the best vehicle they could have been in for this type of a crash. Yet, yet he ends up dying in the crash. And he didn't have bones sticking out. He didn't get ejected out the windshield or anything like that. The airbag deployed, but he still died. So evaluating the crash, going over everything, he didn't have his seatbelt on. In this case, he went into the steering wheel with his chest. The force from the airbag deploying into his chest uh, damaged his aortic valve, pressure built, and as they were evaluating him at the scene, trying to figure out what was going on with him, the pressure built to the point that it blew out and he bled out right there. He would have been alive today had he just worn his seatbelt. It was a simple choice that he made. You can't stop time and all of a sudden decide, I need it now. You make that choice when you get in that vehicle to drive. You make a conscious decision at that moment in time to put your seatbelt on or not. And hopefully you make it because you could die if you don't. But if we run into you on the roadway, these are the violations that we deal with. $85 violation right now for not wearing your seatbelt for a first offense. It goes up, second offense and third offense from there, 175 and 325. Again, the fear of death, I think, should be the most important motivation when it comes to seat belts. Speeding can give you a ride you'll never forget. Ever been on, on a ride somewhere and all of a sudden that moment in time you're like, I don't think this was a good idea? I think we all have, right? Looks like it'll be fun and then something changes, right? And you want to get off, but you can't. You feel trapped. I cannot imagine how many of the cases that I've investigated that that same look came upon the kids' faces just before they crashed. I had a crash with three young men. They were out drinking and partying. They were all 19 years of age. The rear passenger had just turned 19 at midnight. The crash happened a little bit after midnight. Laughing it up, 
cranking the radio. Like this is just something that they're going to remember for the rest of their lives. It's that important to them. This is memories that we're making here. They were traveling about 85 miles an hour. The operator was obviously impaired. They went around a corner and lost control and they went into a tree. The rear passenger was partially ejected out the back window and the operator ended up calling 911 to report the crash and he was freaked out thinking that, you know, he did this. I might have killed my friend. In that moment in time, things changed. 911, what is the address of your emergency? Hey, I'm right by Oak Hill Pass. I just got an accident. Please help me. Okay, are you by yourself or is there more people in the car? There are two friends of mine with me. I just got in an accident. I think we're okay. Oh, my friend is freaking out, okay? Okay, what happened? Did you roll over? We just hit a tree, I think. I haven't looked up. I haven't moved. I just called 911. My friend Richard is asleep. My friend Tyler is begging for me for help. Your friend Richard's asleep, or...? Okay, can you can someone check to see if he's breathing? I just don't want them to be hurt. We need to check to see if your friend out back is breathing. Yes. What? Please don't want to lose him. Well, I need to. You need to let me know if he's breathing. He is breathing, but I can't live with him conscious of without my dad. You can't what? I could never live with his conscience moving on my dad. Yeah, and that's why you need to listen to me so we can get him help if he needs it. Okay, where is he bleeding from? I don't know, Tyler. Please help us out. There's someone here. Oh, all right. Let, let me know when they're right with you. I'll explain it to you like this. When you first get your license and you go out there, you're going to have this nice white puffy cloud over your head that follows you around. As you start to make bad decisions and bad choices, that cloud slowly darkens and it follows you around. As you start to continue to make bad choices, it continues to get darker and darker. At any point in time, those bad decisions could come back and rain down upon you with destruction. And I see it. I see it all the time. Didn't these kids realize that doing this stuff is going to end like this? Because I see it. I know if you go out drinking and partying, drive down the roadway at 85 miles an hour, messing around, something bad could happen and you may end up going into a tree at 85 miles an hour. Like I've seen it. I've seen the end result. And I just wonder as they're doing this, do they realize that that cloud is there and that at any point in time, it could rain down upon you. And just don't put yourselves in that situation. If you guys get involved in a speeding issue, this is what we deal with. Speed one to nine miles an hour of a speed limit, it's 134, it goes up in increments of five miles an hour from there, all the way up to 278. And then anything 30 miles an hour or more is a criminal offense, um, which is a mandatory license suspension. When you guys think about speed, a lot of times you, you're thinking about, you know, driving, you know, 80 and a 50, you're, you're talking about 20, 30 miles an hour over the speed limit, and, and you probably think that that's, that's the speed that, that's a big issue. I've got a story for you that will express to you why that's not necessarily the case. Um, how many of you think nine miles an hour of the speed limit's not a big deal? Think it's, it's just nine over? It's not a problem. Probably the police officer's not gonna stop you for that because we do have people doing 20, 30 miles an hour of the speed limit all day long. So nine miles an hour, you feel like you're safe, but you're not. So 13 year old boy uh, was walking to school. Uh, he entered into a crosswalk and as he started across the crosswalk, uh, he observed a vehicle uh, approaching him. At that moment in time, he recognized that the speed of the vehicle was at a rate that he was in danger. 
and he started running. Uh, he was hit by this car and killed. And he only had a foot to go to get out of the way of the car. As crash reconstructionists, it's our responsibility to go to the scene, evaluate the evidence, and determine uh, what happened, and try and calculate speeds um, of the vehicle. In this case, uh, the vehicle was deemed to be doing between seven and nine miles an hour of the speed limit. That was the difference between life and death. Had that vehicle not been doing nine miles an hour of the speed limit, that 13-year-old boy would be alive today. And I guarantee that driver didn't think that they were doing anything dangerous either. It's just nine miles an hour of the speed limit. It's a simple thing. Well, that simple thing took the life of a 13-year-old boy. You are responsible for your speed. Every mile an hour you do over the speed limit, you own. And anything that comes because of it is your responsibility. That driver will have to live with that for the rest of her life, that her choice to go a little fast that morning ultimately led to the death of a 13-year-old boy just walking to school in a crosswalk. There is no speed that is safe except the speed limit. Distracted driving violations that we deal with here in Maine. Texting and operating a motor vehicle. Understand that if you're texting in your motor vehicle while it is running on the roadway here in Maine, that is a violation. One of the trends that we've seen recently are operators that are stopped at traffic lights, stopped at stop signs. That's still a violation. If you are on Maine roads and your vehicle is running and you are behind the wheel, you are operating a motor vehicle and you cannot be texting. The specific distracted driving law that we have on the books here in Maine is failure to maintain control of motor vehicle. This is a determination by law enforcement that you are distracted while operating a motor vehicle and commit a traffic offense. Distracted driving is any action that takes away from your primary focus of operating a motor vehicle. This can be anything that you do within your vehicle. Talking to your passenger, looking over your shoulder, picking something up off the floor, talking on your phone, texting, changing your radio, anything that you do that takes away from your primary focus is distracted driving. I had a case recently that's a prime example of what we're looking for in this violation. I was following a motor vehicle on the roadway, seemed to be driving just fine, and then all of a sudden, the vehicle veered into oncoming traffic and started weaving all over the road. I turned my emergency lights on and stopped the vehicle for failing to maintain its lane. When I reached the operator, the operator explained to me that she was trying to fix her contact while she was driving. This is an extremely unsafe thing to do. Simply just pull over and deal with the issue. A contact goes in your eye. Your eyes are needed to focus on the roadway. So if you're messing with your contact while driving down the roadway, that is clearly a distracted driving issue. So she was issued a citation for failing to maintain control of motor vehicle. When you make that choice to do whatever simple little task you think it is, and you can't maintain your lane, you're all over the place, you're going into oncoming traffic, you're choosing to continue to drive while you do this task that could potentially kill someone. And we've had that happen. Where people have been killed as a result of a simple act. I had a case where a woman was traveling along the roadway, she went to grab a cigarette out of her pack. Dropped the pack of cigarettes on the floor of her vehicle. She reached down to get the pack of cigarettes. And when she came back up, she was on the wrong side of the road, going head on at another vehicle. She swerved back towards her lane, it was too late. The other vehicle swerved trying to avoid the impact. They impacted on the center line. The passenger was killed. She, she took a woman's life because she was going to get a cigarette. If you drop something on the floor of your vehicle, just pull over. Because it doesn't take but a couple of seconds to go into the oncoming lane and change someone's life forever. TV visible to operator is a violation that we deal with here in Maine. 
understand this applies to streaming movies or videos on your tablets or mobile device. You cannot download movies from Netflix and watch it while you're driving down the highway. We recently had an issue where a commercial bus driver was actually watching a movie while he was transporting passengers southbound on the highway. Would you want to be a passenger on that bus? This is not a good choice, it's not a good idea. You need to focus on your driving and you're driving alone. No watching movies. Reading while operating a motor vehicle here in Maine is a violation of state law. You cannot read a book, you cannot read a magazine, you can't get caught up on your studies at school. Put it away, focus on your driving, there's no reason for it here. In 2019, Maine created a hands-free driving law. This law is separate from the texting law and states that you cannot operate a motor vehicle in Maine with an electronic device in your hand. It's as simple as that. You're allowed to have a device mounted to your dash or in the seat beside you, but it cannot be in your hand. You're allowed one touch of that device to activate or deactivate a feature or function of that phone. An example of this would be skipping a song on your device while you're driving. But remember, it needs to be mounted or in that seat right beside you. If you're found in violation of this law, it's an $85 fine for the first offense and a $325 fine for second and subsequent offenses. How close does a motorcycle have to be before you see it? Here or here? At an intersection, look, look, then look again. Think, look twice for motorcyclists. So this crash, this young man had, had just gotten his license, not the one on the motorcycle, the one on the SUV. He came up on an intersection, the motorcycle had the right of way, um, the young man in the SUV looked left, looked right, and then went. What did he do wrong? He only looked once, right? When you look once, what will you miss? How small is that motorcycle, 300 feet down the roadway? As I, as I look off to my right, is there anything to my right that may obstruct the view of that motorcycle? You have the A-pillar for your windshield, yard sale signs at some intersections, stop signs, telephone poles, you could have a sticker on your windshield that obstructs that. You could have something hanging from your mirror, which you shouldn't, but you could, right? Is there something there that could obstruct that, right? So if you look a second time, is there a greater likelihood that you're going to see that? I look three times, drives my wife nuts. But I've gone to way too many of these crashes to take a chance. I just always look three times. Um, I am always, always, always very, very cautious. The gentleman in this crash actually lived, thankfully. Um, he's in, he got roughed up, broke a lot of things, and he'll have lifetime um, issues associated with that, but thankfully he did live. Each year, hundreds of police officers and emergency workers are either killed or injured by passing vehicles in the United States. Maine's move over law is designed to protect Maine's first responders from some of these dangers. If you see an emergency vehicle ahead of you stopped on the side of the road with their emergency lights activated, you must first change lanes away from the vehicle and move over safely if possible. Or slow down below the posted speed limit and maintain a safe and prudent speed while approaching and then passing the emergency vehicle. Remember Maine. Whenever you see an emergency vehicle ahead with its lights on, please don't forget to move over. Or slow down and proceed with caution. Help protect those who protect you. We have your back. Do you have ours? Please give us some space to work. Help keep all of our first responders safe on main roads. Move over. It's the law. Move over law here in Maine. If you see a stationary emergency vehicle in the shoulder of the roadway, slow down first. Move over if the lane opposite is available, and then you can proceed. As the statute reads, if that lane is available, you need to move over into it. You understand, if you're on the highway and you come up upon a cruiser or a wrecker or a maintenance vehicle that's in the shoulder, 
can you always get into the opposite lane? No. But then what can you do? You can slow down, right? I've had my back grazed by vehicles at 70 miles an hour. Feeling that mirror graze your back is terrifying. <laughs> it is scary. I've been hit, thankfully not at 70 miles an hour. My cruiser's been hit. But I've listened to friends of mine get hit on the highway by vehicles. It's a terrifying thing. You just need to slow down. Anytime you see the lights, first instinct should be slow down and prepare for it, okay? So you can keep us safe out there. The most serious offenses we deal with motor vehicle wise, we talked about operating under the influence, but I'll go into the zero tolerance. Under 21 years of age, you can't have any alcohol in your system whatsoever and operate a motor vehicle. If you do so, your license is invalid, okay? So at the point in time you get behind the wheel to drive and you've had even a drink, that's it. If I detect any indication of alcohol on you whatsoever, your right to drive in Maine is invalid, okay? And you're required to submit to tests if we have evidence to indicate that you have been drinking, okay? Drive, uh, driving to endanger. If you're out in the parking lot and you're doing cookies with your car and showing off for your friends, that may seem like it's fun, but at any point in time, one of those tires could blow and your car's not necessarily gonna go in the intended direction and things may get out of hand and you may run over a couple of said friends. So, so please don't do that. That would be an indication of driving to endanger. Two violations that I like to explain to young people so that they know the difference is eluding an officer and failing to stop for an officer. So eluding is as such. I'll give you an example of a situation that I had. One day I had a vehicle coming at me at 56 and a 35. It's late at night. I turn on the vehicle and turn my blue lights on. The vehicle immediately makes a right turn in the first driveway they can find. Well, that driveway happens to be the entrance to Walmart. It's not my first day, so I was watching for it, and I caught a glimpse of them turning into the driveway. I went after the vehicle, and I got to the driveway. As I got to the driveway, I could see the vehicle going up and around the corner, heading towards the back side of Walmart. When I got up to that next corner, all of a sudden now I could see the vehicle was in the parking lot and was going across the parking lot. Get that vehicle at 70 miles an hour going across the Walmart parking lot. Clearly, that's a red flag that something is up. I followed after the vehicle. The vehicle went down through a rotary. I watched it go out behind a building and go out of sight. This is what I refer to as the boogeyman moment. This is when you're a little kid. If you're in bed and you're scared of something, you can just pull the covers over your head and everything will be okay. This is what this driver did. They went out behind the building, shut off all their lights, and just figured that I would go away. Well, I'm not going away. I went around the other side of the building, put my spotlight on the vehicle that was out in the darkness, and opened up my door, and now I have my sidearm pointed at the vehicle as this is a felony stop. Because the driver of that vehicle has just committed felony eluding. I don't know who's in that vehicle. I don't know why they were driving so recklessly trying to avoid being stopped by the police. I don't know if they've just killed someone. I don't know if they're transporting drugs, if they have guns, if they mean to do me harm. I also don't know if it's a 16-year-old young new driver who's scared and they're worried about losing their license. Well, I ordered the driver out of the vehicle and onto the ground. As I approached the operator and took him into custody, I found out that it was a 16-year-old young driver who was on an intermediate license, who was out after midnight, and knew if they got a violation of their license, they would lose their license. That driver was willing to commit a felony to avoid losing their license. That's an example of a bad choice, and it's also an example of felony eluding. If you choose to not stop, you just pretend like I'm not there, when the blue lights come on, you just look straight ahead and continue driving, that's failing to stop for an officer. You're not going 70 miles an hour across the Walmart parking lot trying to avoid me. You just pretend like I'm not there and you just keep driving at a reasonable pace. So that's the example of eluding an officer versus failing to stop for an officer. Just stop and face the consequences. 
whatever's going to happen is nothing compared to what could happen. Passing a stop school bus, this one's important for the fact that the operator of a motor vehicle that passes a stop school bus with its lights on is responsible for that at that moment in time, right? How often do you think when somebody passes a stop school bus, we actually find that vehicle on the roadway and stop them and, and summons them? Not very often because the bus garage has to radio, the driver has to radio to the bus garage, let them know what's happened. They give a vehicle description, the plate number. By the time it's all said and done, the vehicle's long gone. In, in the case of a stop school bus, the registered owner is responsible, ultimately. We get the registration of the motor vehicle, we track down the registered owner, and we advise them, on this date and time, your vehicle passed a stop school bus. We need the name of the operator of that motor vehicle. If the registered owner does not provide us with that information, the registered owner actually gets summonsed for that violation because they are responsible for that. So that's not something you can hide from, okay? Um, operating after suspension, if your license gets suspended in the state of Maine, just don't drive. That's something that can snowball out of control. Um, I've seen many cases where somebody has a simple suspension violation, but they continue to drive. And then so when you get that subsequent violation, all of a sudden you may get your license back for a week, but then the new violation goes through the system and you get suspended again and again and again. If you get suspended here in Maine, just don't drive, wait out your suspension and get your license back the appropriate way, okay? Leaving the scene of a motor vehicle crash is a class E crime, except in cases where serious bodily injury are involved, that makes it a felony. Two teenagers are dead in a car crash in West Paris and police say drinking and texting are at least partly to blame. It happened just after midnight on Route 219. Police say the car, driven by 18-year-old Christina Lowe, drifted off the road and crashed into some trees. She, along with one of the passengers, 22-year-old Jacob Scaff, both from Paris, were seriously injured. But the other two people in the car, 19-year-old Logan Dam and 16-year-old Rebecca Mason, were both killed instantly. One investigator told the Bangor Daily News that the driver had been drinking and was texting at the time of the crash. I still have nightmares of seeing what I saw that night. And it not only affected us as fire and rescue personnel, but it affected everybody in the town. Yeah, she was very much uh, an outgoing, caring person. Said hi to a lot of people that didn't have folks that said hi to him. She was just bubbly that way. She had a lot of friends, and everywhere they went, they were dressing up in some kind of crazy costume that they had put together, you know, each one of them, and enjoyed and loved being outside, riding the four-wheeler, um, and uh, anything fun. Uh, water slides, water parks, just like a normal 16-year-old probably would be, I would say. It was a very, you know, very normal, very typical night. You know, she was doing her homework and, and uh, watching, maybe watching a little TV. My um, sister-in-law was going out with a, a gentleman that was uh, plowed driveways. So he was out plowing and it was during, the, we had just a teeny little bit of snow that night. Um, and she had called because she had heard on um, either social media or somebody had called them and said that there was a, a fatal accident. We knew there was a couple of people that had survived and a couple of people that had not. And so from that point, um, I went down to her room and I said, oh, no, she's here. I, I, I'm pretty sure she's here. And this was oh, probably 1.30 in the morning, I'm guessing. And I went over and pulled the covers back. She was gone. Um, so um, that was pretty much how it all began for us. We got a call from our 911 dispatch for a motor vehicle crash with multiple injuries. Uh, rollover style off of Route 219 in the town of West Paris. Immediately we started making phone calls, trying to find out different things, my wife and I, um, to find out where Becca had gone. Um, I went outside, I really, I, I could see some sneaker prints um, and that's where she had, she had um, left the house without us knowing. 
um, like I said, probably around midnight, and she had um, met some of these other folks down at the corner. So uh, we immediately got in the vehicle, headed for 219, and unfortunately along the way, just out of luck, I guess, uh, that um, the, the uh, tow truck went by um, that actually had the car on it. And um, the devastation, I mean, just the, the top of the vehicle and the way it looked, it was just, um, you know, I mean, immediately we started going into extreme panic mode as parents wondering what happened to Becca um, and, you know, who had survived and who hadn't. When I arrived on scene, I walked down to the vehicle. What first caught my eye was the fact that there was tire tracks going up over a little road and the damage in the tree was approximately 17 feet up. And so I walked down the vehicle and assessed the damage and looked inside and it just was so disturbing and it, it bothers me to this day. The driver and the front seat passenger had fled the scene on foot and were, was unknown where they were or if they were injured. The moment we found out, we were um, sitting in our basement um, and the officers pulled into our dooryard and, you know, they did ask us a couple more questions just to confirm because the coroner had not been there to actually see yet. Um, and there were specific things to her, um, her favorite car, heart jacket, um, you know, that she always wore. And... Uh, you know, the pants, shirt that she might have been wearing, uh, shoes she might have been wearing, um, that type of thing. And once we confirmed, you know, the certain types of clothes that she might be wearing, that's when they said, well, we're, we're here to tell you that your daughter has um, been killed in a, in a uh, vehicle accident. The moment in time it really, it really hit us was <clears throat> when we went and, and, um, had, had, was having to go down to identify the body. And it was just like uh, the biggest gut punch you've ever had in your life. You start replaying their life, you know, what, what could I have done different as a parent? It's the deepest, the deepest pain that you can possibly ever imagine. And, uh, you know, it's it's not anything that anybody would want to experience. Um, it changed my family. We kind of tiptoe around it a little bit, um, you know, because of the different raw emotions. You know, my father, um, it's 85 years old now. Um, he's always digging up old pictures or whatever else. And, I mean, he, he just, you know, breaks down and cries. Uh, my sister... You know, uh, my brother, uh, my son uh, is probably, he, he um, actually keeps himself fairly well composed, but I know it, it bothers him a lot. Um, um, there are certain days, obviously, that it's, um, it hits you a little bit harder. Um, stupid things like... Uh, Seeing her old school bus driver, you know, will just can wreck your day. Her birthday was on my wife's and I anniversary. So it is very difficult for me to uh, go out and enjoy um, anniversary with my wife because we always spent the day um, with Becca. Um, doing her, her birthday thing. I do rem miss Rebecca every day. I would never, ever wish this on anybody else. As you can see, the choices you make have potentially catastrophic consequences. In this case, you have a driver that chose to speed, text after having been drinking and using marijuana, and ultimately led to the deaths of her two passengers, Becca Mason and Logan Dam. She was ultimately charged with manslaughter. 
in Maine, manslaughter has two parts to it. It's either one, you're found criminally responsible in regards to the choices that you've made, whether it be operating in the influence and your impairment caused the crash, so you were committing a crime at the time of the crash that took someone's life, or in totality, your actions are deemed to be reckless. So you either criminally or recklessly cause the death of another. In this case specifically, it was reckless because speeding, texting, drinking, and using marijuana in totality were deemed to be reckless. She was charged, convicted, and sent to jail for her actions. But that's, that's not what really matters. The fact that she was charged and she went to jail, the effects of this crash will affect the community forever. The students in that school that were classmates will never forget their classmate that died and how tragic it was. The first responders that arrived to that scene will never forget what they saw that night. Those families will never recover from losing a loved one so young, so full of life. It gives me goosebumps every time I think of this case, remembering everything about it. That was based on someone's choice. They chose to do these things. And why we bring this presentation to you is because we wanna make sure you know and understand the choices you make have consequences. Whenever I go to a crash and I look at the aftermath, I think to myself, do these kids know that this was a consequence for their actions? Do they know driving around a corner at 85 miles an hour after you've been drinking could have catastrophic end? Well, that's why I'm bringing it to you now. That's why we're giving you these stories, sharing our experiences so you know that it's there. We want you to make good choices. If there's one thing you take from this, remember this. I told you about that white puffy cloud. I told you when you start driving, that cloud is following you around. And when you start making bad choices, that cloud darkens. And you don't know what day is gonna come when that cloud rain down, rains down upon you. That's what happened that night at this crash. That cloud opened up and rained down upon them and the effects will be everlasting. Be safe, make good decisions, and I don't wanna meet you out there on the road.